I'm really looking forward to this talk. If, uh, if you've been to a lot of talks so far, you know that they have all been pretty, pretty technical. My understanding is we are going to get some entertainment and some jokes and some stories from, uh, from Ben here. So let's get excited. Give Ben Morris a big round of applause who is going to talk to us about AWS. Have a great time, man. Thank you very much. Have fun. Really appreciate it. Hey, everyone. How's it going? You guys having a good time? All right, so am I, so am I. Thanks for coming in today. I know you guys have probably been waiting in a lot of lines and uh, yeah, I just really appreciate you guys being so excited coming here to see this talk. Put a lot of work into it, so thank you. And uh, we're gonna be talking about a lot of cool stuff today. We're gonna be stealing lots of secrets and we're gonna be uh, hacking AWS and showing how I did it all and then talking about how we can uh, basically help fix the issue and uh, if you just uh, give me one sec to actually get my timer started, because I am, okay, perfect. So, yeah, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, just a little bit of a disclaimer before we uh, get started here. Uh, please do not arrest me, FBI. Uh, no post exploitation was performed, and everything I found was basically publicly available already. Um, I'm not going to be talking about any AWS zero days or any exploits in customers specific software. This is just a widespread misconfiguration issue with AWS and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more later but basically you know I was just kind of driving down the road and I looked out the window and said to myself huh a lot of people's disks are on fire. I should probably you know just call the police and let them deal with it and I just kind of kept driving. So didn't do a lot of post exploitation and I definitely stuck to you know the look but don't touch. But anyway, um, so what is EBS? EBS stands for Elastic Block Store and it's essentially a virtual hard disk that you can attach to a VM. So anytime you spin up a virtual machine inside of AWS, it's going to have a disk that's automatically provisioned to it. And that disk is an EBS volume. They can vary in size and the default is like 8 gigabytes, but basically anytime you start building an application using uh, Amazon EC2, you're going to be running one, one of these EBS volumes. So they contain your application code, your data, and everything else you would want to deploy. So these volumes, they can basically be detached and reattached to various machines. You can move them around, kind of like a network attached storage in a way. So um, they can, you can clone them, you can delete them, you can copy them, you can do everything with them that you would expect. And um, they come in generally four flavors for security purposes. They come in unencrypted, encrypted, and public, and private. So you can have a combination of them like a public, unencrypted, private, encrypted, public, encrypted, and whatnot. And we're going to be looking at the uh, public and unencrypted ones today. Those are the ones that are interesting and uh, those are just the fun ones that have all the credentials in it. So if you have, you know, an encrypted uh, or private disk, they're not really vulnerable. And also, um, these disks by public or by default are private. So when you do spin up that instance, it is going to be backed by a private volume, which kind of made this uh, vulnerability really interesting to me. I wanted to know, you know, who is out there exposing their disks to the public when it, AWS actually makes it pretty tough. You know, you have to go into a separate menu after you create the snapshot and after you create the image to actually go check that public box. So I was really curious to know you know, who is out there doing this? So what could possibly go wrong with an unencrypted and public disk? Well, basically in, back in January I was at an onsite for a client and you know I was just really jet lagged and not able to sleep. I'm sure you guys have all been there. It's like you, you know you're on the west coast and you gotta fly all the way to the east coast or you're on the east coast and you gotta fly to the west coast and you get to that hotel and you sit there and you're at the bar, but there's nothing to do. You know, you're just stuck there. And then it's like 1 a.m., the bar's closed, there's nothing there. And you basically just say, well, I'll go sit on my computer. Fine. So I thought to myself, well, I'll look at uh, this client's cloud security controls. That'll definitely put me to sleep, you know? 
Um, except that it really didn't. Uh, I basically found an unencrypted EBS volume that was public on their account and I really wasn't familiar with this vulnerability so I just did what everyone else does and I just googled it. You know and I found some blog posts but there were only a couple of them and they didn't really talk about um, this vulnerability very much. They basically said oh well that's bad but just don't do it and it's fine. Which is you know it always just piques my interest. I'm like okay well I gotta know more now. Um, you know so I basically took this client's disk and I went through the 27 steps of attaching it to my VM through the console and mounted it and I realized that this client had made a copy of their entire web application available to the public internet and this basically had everything to run the app including their AWS access keys, their AWS secret keys, API keys for third parties, database credentials because you know of course and of course the database was exposed to the internet because why not? Of course you'd want to do that when you have AWS, you know, that's totally normal. So after I discovered that disk and basically had this, you know, incredibly critical finding, um, I knew I basically had to investigate more. I needed to know, you know, how, how um, widespread was this bug because this bug was really powerful. It had, you know, the keys to the kingdom for this whole application. So, you know, I started doing some digging and I wanted to ask myself, well, why does this happen? You know, how can this happen? Um, and basically, there's two screenshots here. You want your disks to look like the top screenshot there. It, if you can see it says uh, there's a, this snapshot is currently private and that's what you want it to look like. By default that's what it will be. But if you go into that tab and you change it to public or you use the API you have some kind of broken API code that ends up setting that uh, snapshot to public, what happens is it shows up in that nice search box down there at the bottom. And this search box is wonderful because you type in the word Jenkins and Jenkins servers come up and you type in the word backup and backup servers come up. So at th basically at that point you know I kind of realized like whoa this is really cool, got something here and um, basically when you do set that public tab and it shows up in that search box, if it does have sensitive information in it you have to assume it's compromised um, at this point. Um, because anyone can go search through it. And I don't know if you guys have heard about um, like the Capital One stuff that just happened recently or any kind of other like S3 bucket exposures. This is kind of a similar vulnerability to that um, in that it's it, you know it, it's kind of going through someone's uh, private data storage that they think is private but it's really not. And one cool thing about this bug is all of the snapshots are queryable and you can pull all of the IDs back from the API. It's not like an S3 bucket where you would have to start guessing people's uh, bucket names to try to find one and if they said something like a GUID for their bucket name you're not really going to be able to find it. So this, this made it really really fascinating and really cool to me because you could basically just start going through all of their stuff um, in a programmatic fashion, very easy and you know even if you just want to use the web GUI you just start you know typing in stuff in there. So um, at that point I was just like this is awesome. Um, and so let's just talk a little bit about what I found. Because everyone likes loot and uh, yeah that's what you're all here for. So. Uh, what did I find on these buckets? I found a lot of stuff. So I'm going to give, first I'm going to give three uh, examples of some critical exposures that I was able to find and then I'm going to kind of talk at a higher level and talk about um, overall trends and some more stuff that I did find. Um, so the first example I'm going to talk about is about some robots. And I like robots. Robots are great. They're our friends. And if you think about robots and service accounts in your own organization, you may be thinking about, you know, your Slack bot or, you know, other chat bots you have. And think about the, what those robots can do. They can do things like push code or, you know, deploy new builds. They can do a lot of stuff and have a lot of access. But usually there's this, you know, interface between you and the bot, like some kind of chat or something that lets you, you know, that delegates permissions. So, um, 
this case I was able to find these credentials in this user data dot config file on this random disk basically and I was a robot. So what could I do with robot? Well I didn't have any permission restrictions and you know the ability to you know deploy stuff seems pretty great. And um when I started looking at the disk um oh one more thing uh this uh this output right here is basically the equivalent of who am I for AWS. There's one command you want to run whenever you find a set of credentials it's called uh a STS get caller identity and that basically is like who am I. Anytime you have a set of any credentials you can pretty much always call this API endpoint um no matter your region and it will come back with you know who you are. So this is just a simple listing of you know uh who I am. And uh so I started looking through this disk to try to find clues. Uh one thing that's interesting about this is you always gotta have like the scavenger hunt to figure out who owns the disk and who uh you know who who owns it. So um in some config files that these creds were near um there was some database configs with some internal URLs and uh some some just some domain names and these domain names led me to a pretty cool company. And uh the company ended up uh doing a lot of really interesting things like uh tracking ISIL social media requests and uh posts and they did things like uh record border interdictions and they were basically a uh, software as a service company that sold pretty much exclusively to the government. So they're just doing government stuff and uh their robots keys are just sitting out there for anyone to go grab. So if you guys wanted to you know read up on what ISIS is doing uh you know on social media these are the guys you want to talk to. So you know at this point I basically like shit my pants and it's like you know what am I in control of right now? Um so you know we reached out to this company and they were you know of course very grateful and they you know super positive response um and they gave us like some remediation steps. So uh they really liked this and um yeah, this was this one just kind of highlights this problem entirely. Like it's just you know you could find anything out there and these accidental exposures could contain anything really. Um so it was really interesting just kind of going through them all. The uh the next set of credentials I want to highlight is uh something I just call woot woot and basically um there was a disk with a docker file and if you guys are familiar with Docker, it's just a way to manage your infrastructure, basically. And there was some other code around there. There's like a GoLang program uh, that was compiled, and then there were some kind of scripts. And it looked like they were mostly for system administration. It looked like this thing was responsible for, uh, you know, spinning up infrastructure. And the one thing uh, that I couldn't really figure out was who actually owned this disk. Um, the config files didn't really have any clues. There weren't any domains. It was all just like internal 10 dot addresses. So it was just kind of like, okay, well, I don't know who owns this disk. But what I did know was, you know, which account I was and who I was. And who I was was root. So just out of thin air, I was able to grab some root credentials for this account. And if you're not familiar with AWS, root is, is basically God permissions on an AWS account. It has unrestricted access, it's an administrative account. And you're actually um not even really supposed to use them. You're kind of supposed to delegate uh an account or you're supposed to create an admin account and delegate admin permissions to it. So that way you're not directly using the root account. But these guys thought it was a bright idea to just start using that root account and they said oh well no one will ever find this disk you know it's just some internal thing that uh spins up infrastructure no one even really interacts with it except me you know. So the you know the the highlight here is just you know you could find everything. This was actually the only set of root creds I found in the disks. So that was kind of cool. Um I, I honestly wasn't even expecting to find it um just because I think everyone kind of knows not to do this now but um this just highlights again just the critical nature of these uh disks and what they contain because a lot of people just aren't expecting you to be able to get access to these ones. So um the next one I want to talk about is a little it's about a little piece of software I love near and dear to my heart it's Jenkins and 
if any of you guys have uh, you know owned some Jenkins machines out there, you know why I love it. It's always full of credentials. It like has access to production source code and it can like push builds. People do all kinds of crazy stuff in their Jenkins jobs. So you know anytime you come across a Jenkins server, it's just great. You know tons of stuff. So um, in this case, I found a Jenkins server and it was basically, it looked like a developer instance. It looked like to me some developer was trying to get an internal application to work with their, um, their own uh, Jenkins setup. So they kind of like spun up a copy of their Jenkins server and were trying to, you know, get an application to work properly with it. Um, so, you know, I, in the Jenkins server, I found some AWS credentials and I popped them into the STS get caller identity and I found out I was a dude named Kumar. And I thought, well, that's great. I, uh, I'm Kumar now. Sounds good. So, uh, I looked in the users.xml file, which is, if you're not familiar with Jenkins, that is just the file that holds basically all of your usernames and passwords for users on the machine. And that's kind of assuming there's no single sign on in place or no active directory integration. But, um, so this users.xml file was kind of funny because, um, I looked at who made the server, who had the admin account and their email address and it was definitely not anyone named Kumar. So, you know, it was kind of funny. Some guy sat there and uh, first they exposed their disk publicly, which was really bad and they exposed their AWS credentials but then they like also framed their coworker somehow. I don't know why. Maybe they, maybe they were trying to like frame their coworker. I don't understand. But um, yeah, so Kumar, uh, we got his keys and uh, you know started looking around, um, trying to figure out uh, who this was. And from the email address, we were able to determine it was a uh, software company. And the software company, um, I can't name them, but I can talk about you know who uh, who they do business with. And from their website, you know these are the people they work with. They work with you know Salesforce, Apple, FIS, um, a lot of other like Fortune, you know Fortune whatever N companies. Um, so, you know, this is a large software kind of consultancy firm and uh, they just did, you know, a lot of cool stuff but, um, you know, these keys are just, uh, they're, they're just sitting out there and they're keys that could potentially impact these other companies who, you know, I'm sure Salesforce and Apple and all of them, they have, you know, very good perimeter security and they're making sure that they have, you know, a tight, a tight leash on their developers so they're not doing this kind of stuff. But in this case, you know, you could almost have a compromise happen because of a contractor who maybe, you know, only has indirect access. And, you know, are, are, you, are you really watching that whole supply chain of, you know, your contractors and who you're actually doing business with to make sure their security is also not weak? Um, because in this case, you know, the compromise could, you know, could definitely lead to some pretty severe consequences um, just with the amount of work this company does. So, you know, overall these kind of three exposures highlight the critical severity and, and uh, just the kind of stuff you're gonna find when you come across these disks. And all of this just makes sense. You know, these are just like people's application servers. It's just a lot of developers kind of, uh, you know, uh, doing whatever and trying to just make their stuff work. Um, so, you know, overall we had, uh, these are kind of the things I was looking for. Um, when uh, w when you get into a disk, you find a lot of leaked source code, of course, because they're you know mostly application servers. So a lot of people are doing AWS right, and they have a set of temporary credentials, which allows their credentials to basically expire. So you know if you don't get access to those credentials within about 24 hours, I think is the default. Um, you know those credentials rotate out. So, you know, that's good, but even if those credentials rotate out, you're still going to have that source code laying around on someone's disk. So, you know, we found a source code for some government contractors, um, some large tech companies, and a lot of these are just like boring internal applications, but a lot of them also give really good insight into how these companies operate. Even just having their source code is really dangerous. Um, you know, we got like source code for a bunch of internal applications to um, like host uh, like huge databases for uh, some like tech companies and stuff. So it's just like, uh, really, really cool uh, source code. Even if, even if that's all you get, and you know, at the end of the day, it's just a medium, kind of like a medium risk finding. But 
Um, another thing we got was tons of private keys. I know it says SSH up there, but just lots of uh, private keys. Think about like TLS certificates and whatnot. Uh, we were, we have just like tons of client and server keys. And anytime you know you're using one of those exposed uh, server keys, you can be man in the middle. And some of the client keys we got, you know, just allow SSH access. You know, you're like going through people's bash histories and trying to figure out, well, where are these IPs? You know, who's who's running these servers? Try to figure it out. Um, so you know that was a little bit harder to uh, determine if those creds were valid. So a lot of the SSH keys and whatnot, we just directly handed over to AWS and just responsibly disclosed it with them to make sure they got you know word to their customers, hey, your keys are just sitting there. Uh, you should probably do something about that. So um, another thing we got a lot of, which was kind of surprising to me, was uh, like SQL files that contained a lot of people's uh, personal information. And I think a lot of these came from developers. They would, um, you know, steal or borrow some data from production, move it down to a development environment, and so they can play around, debug their application, do whatever they needed to do. But then they kind of left their disk out there, just sitting there. And these SQL files contained like thousands of people's, uh, you know, usernames, hashed passwords, email addresses, phone numbers, all of that stuff. So just some like really nasty hygiene around uh, like SQL files and and just kind of all of that. And um, another thing we got a lot of were like WordPress installations, which are pretty cool. Um, they if you get a WordPress uh, backup, um, I, I should clarify that you know the WordPress like uh, some of the some of the things we found were WordPress backups actually. So um, in the backup, you know, you're going to have like uh, the database, which will be basically a SQL file, and that'll contain like all the password hashes and also like API tokens for third parties, which are always great to find because they allow you to escalate further, do uh, you know more privilege escalation kind of in their own environment. You can potentially start taking over more and more resources. So you know, finding those API tokens was also really really great. Um, and a lot of just kind of like off the shelf software. It seemed like a, a common pattern would be like developers again kind of like uh, just doing a bunch of dev debug work, pulling down some stuff like a Drupal instance, throwing it up there and then just leaving it there. So um, a lot of those kind of uh, credentials were laying around and also VPN credentials. Uh, lots of open VPN. Uh, creds and some of them were for legitimate companies who you know were using it to access their internal network. So at, you know at that point um, you know it's pretty much game over because that's you know it's kind of one of the big goals of an external attacker is to get internal network access. So uh, that was really cool. But also I found a lot of people had their like hide my ass creds and uh, other like VPN providers just sitting out there on these disks, and that made me really really you know curious. Um, just like what kind of attacks could you accomplish? You know, you could definitely just you know abuse them, but could you also like maybe man in the middle of them when they think they're on their VPNs? I'm not really sure, but um, I thought that was really cool to find, and also really curious. You know, people are kind of automating automating their hide my ass setups, um, and then also just in general, we just found lots of AWS keys, Google OAuth tokens, you know, third party API tokens, email passwords, think about like your SMTP creds, your web apps are using SMTP to send mail or Mailgun. Um, like one thing I, one app I specifically remember uh, very clearly is something called, uh, it was just called surveillance app. Like that was the repo name. I found their like dot git directory and it was just like surveillance app. Okay. And so I looked at it and it's just a, a bunch of code that just takes raw RTSP streams and just dumps them into S3 buckets. So, you know, whoever or whatever this thing is surveilling, I have all of their keys now. You know, I can go read their buckets, I can go, you know, look at who's uh, you know, who's being watched and I could basically surveil their surveillers and uh, that one was so hard to like not touch. I did not, you know, like it's so hard to just not touch this stuff and, and want to just explore so that one in particular, you know, you like want to see like webcam roulette, you know, you always want to see what's behind that webcam or like uh, you know, one of those uh, crappy cameras that uh, you know, is just on the internet. So um, that one in particular was just kind of funny to me. It was really hard to just kind of bite my tongue there. Um, 
so yeah, so overall we just we just uh looked for, you know, a lot of the easy wins. Um you know, when I initially started off a lot of this research, I kind of had this dream of like, oh, I'll steal everything under the sun and then just deal with it later and you know kind of like go through it. But it just turned out that uh kind of grepping for the common stuff you'd think uh would be good it was was a good approach. Um you know, just this just uh kind of goes to show like we had a lot of success there. So, um yeah, just a lot of uh great stuff. And um, you know, sad I couldn't like do a lot more poking with uh, what it actually was. You know, when you do find something, but it was still really, really cool to uh, find all of this stuff. So um, basically, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how I did find all of this. Um, the the vulnerability and the misconfiguration on the surface is pretty easy to exploit, and you know, my uh, you know, that client in back in January, you know, I was doing all of that manually and you can definitely do that. It's uh, it's totally possible. But um, I basically wanted to uh, kind of automate that process a little bit because um, when you talk about temporary credentials and things like that, it is uh, a bit tricky to deal with those manually. Like if you if you have some set of temporary credentials, you know those are exposed for a good window of you know 24 hours. And if you get those credentials, you can basically endlessly refresh credentials. I wasn't, uh, you know, I, I didn't really like. Uh, uh you know look at this too hard but um it's definitely a known technique like if you get those temporary IM credentials you can just refresh them endlessly until they basically rotate them out from underneath you. So it was really important to uh have some automation under your tool belt. You can exploit some instances manually but a lot of the ones you're gonna find are just unlabeled and uh difficult to detect. So you definitely want to have some automation there and uh there's basically a really simple three step exploit process here. Um you know, you're just gonna pick a snapshot, you're gonna attach that snapshot to uh your EC2 instance, and then you're gonna search it for secrets. Um but the problem is there's about 120,000 disks that are exposed across all regions. And a lot of them are just um you're, you're just not sure what they're gonna be because they're not really labeled and a lot of them are just garbage. They're just totally legitimate disks. Um so you know each of each of these steps has some nuances that are uh you know kind of tricky. So uh the first step oh, clicker? Oh, oh, sorry. Uh clicker was malfunctioning. Uh so uh at a high level this is kind of the architecture I used. Um there's nothing really crazy here. I'm basically just using an asynchronous queue to uh send new snapshots to workers and then that master in the middle is just uh is just a little application that kind of coordinates everything. So that master he just pulls all the snapshots uh, about every minute looking for new ones. When a new one is detected it just it just puts it in the, the queue and then the worker in each region that um you know it, the message is destined for will just pick up that message and start the scraping process which uh, you know extracts all the secrets and it just throws it into the database. So it's a pretty simple process and uh this this uh this asynchronous queue and worker setup gives us the ability to scale up and scale down the worker processes as we need. So we can save a little bit of money too. Uh which is always nice. So um and all of the all of the code and all of the um the scanning has is within the default AWS API limits. I didn't have to um like ask for you know oh, well, I need to scan lots of disks. Um they let you do like five disks concurrently uh across everything so you know within those limits within a default AWS account limit I was able to to scan these disks. So there wasn't anything uh any any like um you know any anything preventing me from doing this uh basically. So uh with the architecture out of the way uh step one ex pick an exposed snapshot. So uh what to read. And there's kind of two ways you can go about this. Uh you can do an exhaustive brute force over all of the disks. And that's totally possible. Uh you can spend you know a couple months doing that. Um or you can kind of do a more careful approach. And I initially started off doing the brute force approach like I said I just wanted to steal everything under the sun you know. Um but that just didn't really uh work out. 
for mostly a couple, or for basically like three reasons. Um, I was just fishing up a lot of garbage. So uh, the Human Genome Project is on AWS, and there's like you know genome sequencing happening. So you get like 20 genome sequencing disks in a row, and you're just like, man, I really want some AWS creds. All I'm getting is a ton of garbage, and there's no faster way to you know just uh, thrash your database than just filling it with worthless uh, worthless files from that. So um, so there's that and then each disk also takes about two to five minutes to uh, to scan. So at a minimum just the logistics of, of cloning the disk, mounting it to your image and then detaching it and force detaching it um, takes about two to five minutes. So the more disks you have to scan exponentially you know more time you, you kind of spend um, not exponentially but just a lot more time you spend uh, doing it and also it just costs money. So you know who likes spending the profits right? So um, so basically I, I kind of came up with uh, 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 a way to filter out these disks. Uh, if each disk has an owner ID and that owner ID basically uh, just tells you who made the disk. So I looked at the owner IDs, I just counted them, and I looked at the frequency that owners would publish disks. And what I found was there were a couple of outliers that published about, you know, uh, like 50 or 60 percent of the disks. There are about four to five of them. Uh, one of them is Amazon themselves. So uh, these disks were basically just kind of worthless. They're just deployments of like uh, GitHub Enterprise and just a bunch of stuff you don't care about. So um, I took those and I figured the smaller owner IDs would have a better chance to kind of reel in those credentials and, and get them going. Um, so using that owner ID I was able to cut down the number of disks I had to scan to about 20,000 and uh, that just made the whole process much faster and I was able to finish it in time. Um, so uh, the next step is attaching the volume and there's this like nice AWS butterfly effect that happens where uh, you end up wasting a lot of money because a tiny bug in your code ended up like breaking everything and um, there's some really interesting failure points that I didn't realize exist. Like I didn't know the metadata URL could fail. Um, and you know one day it failed, it crashed my Python script and I had to uh, you know just manually ki you know kill those disks, those zombie disks that were laying around. But it it kind of made me think about well if I'm testing for SSRF and I have a scanning you know some some scanner and it throws the metadata URL at the at the you know target and that metadata URL is had just happens to be broken during that time period you know I just got a false negative and it kind of made me rethink some of the AWS testing um, that I do myself. Um, just in simple cases like that. And then also you're gonna have like a ton of file system issues like LVM disks that just you know, like for some reason it just needs a totally separate tool to unmount and mount. I don't know why but you know, that's just the way it is. So um, you're gonna run into a lot of those issues and you kind of just wanna make sure that you're uh, you know, taking care of them. And then searching the disk for secrets. Um, so one thing you can do is you can use something like DLP diggity or um, like uh, git rob or uh, truffle hog to kind of go through like specific things and that's pretty much what I did. I just uh, I stole the greps from truffle hog, thank you, and uh, and then I kind of came up with some, some of my own to just uh, look for uh, the private keys and, and whatnot. So um, so this so this process uh, it was pretty pretty straightforward. Just mostly uh, grepping for like really high signal stuff, and also uh, I did sniff the MIME type for each file. I would attempt to kind of only scan files that didn't look like um, you know uh, binary or images or whatnot. So uh, th so this kind of cut down on the number of files I had to scan for each disk and led to you know faster uh, you know faster uh, scanning. So um, and and another th interesting thing I did with this as well is. Uh, because you have access to all the default disks on AWS, I just spun up all of the default disks and made like a huge blacklist of every file that you don't want. Um, and I, then I manually like added some for Etsy Shadow. We always want to steal shadow files, so we kind of uh, go through this uh, this whitelisting and blacklisting process. And um, all of this, uh, you know, ended up uh, kind of coming together to make it pretty quick to scan these disks. You know, each disk can kind of go go down in about like seven minutes. So that's pretty good for, uh, you know, for the purposes of my research, and uh, it it ended up working pretty good. Um, and yeah, so we just uh, end up grepping through everything, and you know, it's just just uh, just kind of like uh, some lessons learned. Um, like have tests for your code. The AWS butterfly effect is definitely real. And it's going to return things. Uh, the, the AWS APIs will return errors you definitely don't expect, like the metadata URL failing, 
And also you definitely want to design for like multi-region upfront. Um, I made some design decisions that ended up uh, kind of, you know, um, messing that up a bit because I didn't realize snapshot IDs are actually uh, not um, unique across regions. So you could have two regions, two different snapshots, one snapshot ID. And uh, you know, if the primary key in your database is that ID, you're kind of going to have a bad time. So, uh, yeah, just make sure you uh, think about all of these things up front before you start, uh, you know, kind of looking at it. So, we've kind of talked a little bit about, um, you know, what this is, how to find it, and uh, we can talk about fixing this problem. So, remediation. What does remediation look like? In this case, it is uh, pretty easy, but there's a couple of things that to, to keep in mind. Uh, you definitely want to go and search for your, through your AWS account to find any public disks that are unencrypted. Um, if you do find one that is sens has sensitive information in it and is meant to be, uh, is not meant to be public, you want to take down the snapshot first of all, that should be obvious to everyone, but then you also want to rotate your credentials and I know a lot of people like to skip this step because it's a pain, it's hard, oh there's that one system, you know, that someone built five years ago, we can't rotate the creds, I'm sorry, you know. Uh, but you should definitely rotate the credentials because if you think about the vulnerability, I'm scanning every single disk every minute basically and as soon as you make that snapshot public, I'm going to initiate a copy on it. And once that copy is initiated, it takes about two to three minutes to actually finish the copying process and from that point, the copy is mine. If that copy finishes, you can't do anything about it and you're not even going to know honestly. Um, and that's one cool thing I thought that was uh, interesting about this attack surface is Unlike a lot of other attacks um, with AWS, if you're like, you know, sending a lot of web requests to try brute force directories or, so or something like that, um, you're going to, uh, you know, show up in logs. But in this case, you're not actually directly attacking a, a customer on AWS, so you're actually not going to log anything and it's going to be really difficult for someone to actually detect that you're cloning their disks. There's basically no way to do it. So, um, at least that I could find, you know, in my in my uh, research, there might be some some you know logging set up somewhere, but I couldn't find it. So it's kind of a sneaky attack. You know, you're gonna you're gonna have your cred stolen, and you're going to uh, not really even understand, you know, how it happened because there's no logs. So if I'm stealing your disks every minute, you're gonna want to make sure, even if it's only a brief exposure of the disks, you're going to want to make sure you actually rotate those credentials. Because anyone performing this attack is almost certainly gonna have a setup similar to mine, where they're just kind of pulling it down all the time and uh, and, and not letting you, you know, kind of get away with, uh, without rotating those credentials. So, um, and then the last step is of course to have a little post-mortem. You want to make sure that you understand how this vulnerability happened in the first place. You definitely don't want to uh, just let your developers, you know, just kind of go and, uh, and just kind of have free reign. Um, is this an SDLC problem or is this like a random script that we have that we occasionally use and just happens to create public snapshots? Um, you just don't really know that. So definitely check it out and investigate how you got there. And uh, you're going to want to, uh, you know, uh, go through this process. Uh, you can go through it manually. I'm going to uh, delay the release of the tool just by a couple of weeks to uh, coordinate with Amazon and get some of these uh, disks, you know, taken down. Give people an opportunity to go through their own disks and just make sure there's no exposures. Um, but after after a couple of weeks, I'm going to release Duffel Bag, and you can you know just go download that, and that will help you scan disks. And I've written it in such a way so that um, it will work on kind of any disk you have if it's uh, private or public. So it can help in your own organization uh, scan for disks. You know, because one thing uh, that I find a lot is um, you'll run a Scout Suite report and then you'll get a bunch of EBS volumes that are unencrypted. And sometimes there's like a thousand of them. And you're like, how do I go through all of these and figure out if any of these are actually, if anyone should care about them? So this tool should work with public and private disks as well as like a wide variety of file systems. So you should be able to use this to kind of help uh, sift through uh, that pile of hard drives you do. 
uh, need to go through uh, in your own organization. So definitely check out that in a couple of weeks. That will also help remediate it. And um, we also uh, just kind of wrapping up here, uh, some more loot that I thought was pretty funny. Um, so I always like to look at my favorite password. You know, I always like when I crack passwords, I always like to you know pull out my favorites. So I found like Nug Lover's password, and that was for like a Docker account. Um, so thank you, Nug Lover. And if that's your password, you should probably change it. Um, yeah. And another thing, uh, I was looking at some disks and I found some creds on there. I was super excited. I was, you know, going through everything and uh, super, super jazz, yes, creds. And then I realized, oh my god, this is a capture the flag box. I just captured the flag on a disk I didn't even, know, on a CTF I didn't even know I was playing, you know. <laughs> it's just, it's like, yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty good. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So, th so that was uh, another great find. Oh. And uh, one other thing I found on there was wallet.dats. And uh, if you don't know what that is, that's your private key for your Bitcoin wallet. Um, and I found some like Zcash wallets too and everything. So basically when I found those, I mean my heart rate went up so much. You have no idea. I thought I was about to be crypto rich and you know like go live on my island. Yeah, um, it didn't turn out that way. I'm here and not on an island, so you can definitely know that uh, I didn't really get any money from that. But it was mostly just people toying with uh, cryptocurrency, which is great. But um, you know, didn't get crypto rich, unfortunately, with this bug. Uh, but that would have been nice. So you know, maybe in the future, maybe someone will throw their wallet dot dat up there with a couple hundred bitcoins, whatever. Um, and another thing I found a lot of was SSH keys on Windows machines. And I was really curious about this because I thought a lot of people using AWS and, and whatnot would be um, just using Linux or, or some other disk and it just turned out there was a lot of Windows disks that I wasn't expecting and I had to go and make better blacklists and whatnot. But like every time I get an ID RSA off of a Windows box I just kind of smile a little bit because you know it's kind of like eh, that's cool. Um, so there was like a surprising number of Windows machines uh, out there and a lot of them were misconfigured in this manner to uh, you know to, to facilitate uh, all the secret exposure. So um, lots of Windows disks, just some really cool stuff there and uh, yeah and you know I'm sure that there's a lot more out there. You know I was, only, I was pretty time boxed on this research because you know it started in January and then I kind of put it off and you know uh, you know just said oh well you know no one no one is you know really going to worry about this but then I realized like how widespread this is and wanted to start looking at it more and more in detail. So you know there's still a lot out there. I was only able to like look at text files and whatnot. There still could be like database files and, and lots of other interesting information. Um, and I also only, you know, I kind of limited myself to uh, disks that were under about 100 gigabytes. So there's still like more attack surface. And the cool thing is, new disks pop up every day. There's about five or ten disks that pop up every single day. So it's like every day you get a nice little uh, chance at like a present, uh, or, you know, like a treasure hunt every single day, um, which is just fun, you know. Uh, you get you get those uh, emails back, you know, like ooh, found some found some creds. So. Um, just kind of some conclusions here. Um, I manually validated about 50, you know, sets of credentials, and then after that, I was like, "All right, dude, I can't do this anymore. Like, my uh, my eyes are bleeding, you know, from like grepping out uh, creds and testing them on like a million different things. So I would just kind of uh, give them to Amazon and let them deal with it. Um, I kind of estimate there's about uh, 750 to 1250, you know, high and critical exposures across all the regions. Um, and this is just kind of a direct extrapolation from my, uh, you know, my regions and the disks I was able to look at in this time. And there wasn't really a pattern for, uh, you know, who was impacted. It was just kind of like random um, software, uh, government contractors, healthcare, everyone, uh, everyone just kind of uh, was random. So, not really a whole lot of patterns there. Um, and overall, it would cost about $300 plus R and D time. Um, so it's a very Cost effective attack, which is not my assumption. It would not, it would not have been my assumption, and it wasn't my assumption when I first started this um, because I thought, you know, spinning up all these hard disks would actually be pretty expensive. But it turns out if you destroy them pretty quick after you've scanned them, it just doesn't cost that much. So it's a very cost effective attack. And because you can kind of do it passively, you know, over time, and when a new snapshot pops up, you just go scan it really quick and turn it off. Um, it's pretty cheap to do, which I thought was great. You know, getting a set of root keys for 300 bucks, that seems like a pretty good deal, you know, along with all the other stuff. 
So um you know the research and development time of course and uh yeah and that was basically uh you know just a really cool aspect of this that I really liked. Uh just super cheap, free creds, what could go wrong? Um yeah so that's pretty much it. Uh you know I just want to thank you guys again for coming. I want to thank these people as well. And uh thank you so much for coming here today. Um that's pretty much it. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, enjoy the rest of your DEF CON guys. I'm going to hit the bar and I'll uh, probably field some questions outside if you guys want to chat with me. I I would love to talk about this stuff and uh any ideas you guys got. Um so yeah, have a good one. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.